very well populated session today. Um, welcome to the final set of live demos. Um, we've got four marvelous speakers, two of whom you have seen before. Um, so we're starting with James Purple Idea talking about configuration no management or something along those lines. Okay, take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is going to go really quickly. I gave a full version of this talk, but apparently they were missing out on lightning live demo speakers. And I love live demos, so I'm going to give you like a third of the live demos I did in my main talk, which was recorded because of, there's a great video team. So really, really, really quickly, um, if you have questions, we'll see if we have time at the end, but we won't have many. Uh, James, Purple Idea on the internet. Uh, this is the lightning version of this talk. This is lightning. I made it just for you. Uh, big thank you. Quickly, all the stuff you can read, because this is the lightning version. And just for curiosity, so 06. Why are you all giggling? I didn't even make the jokes yet. So um, here's some stuff. Uh, Puppet, in general, if you're not familiar with Puppet, there's lots of nasty hacks you can do, and it really makes for a very unclean design. And you can read through these slides, which I'll post, or in the main talk. And basically, I come to this conclusion about, is this the right way to do things with all these scary, nasty hacks? Come on. Is it? Of course not. So here's my, my nope guy. So I like to play for you. This is my favorite note person. If you have a better note person, please let me know because I've never found a note that's as nopey as this. And the nope <laughs> thing goes off. Even in a lightning session, it is sufficiently important that I show you how nope this is. So eventually I sat down and I said, I'm going to write a new tool. Oh no, not another tool. But I have a really good reason for it. Um, it's called MGMT config because I really am bad at naming, so I'm sorry. Um, and this is about how Red Hat loves Debian and so on. Um, anyways, my tool has three main design points. Um, the first is that it runs in parallel. So if you think of a graph, it will go through, run the whole DSL in parallel. Um, it's event-driven, which I'll show you shortly, and it works as a distributed system. And let's see if we can get through these three demos. So here's your sort of status quo. Um, you go through, the red lines are basically what one puppet execution might look like, doing one, two, three, four, five, and six, and then seven. But in fact, um, you can actually parallelize this to have the whole left side run at the same time as the whole right side. Make sense? Yes. Yes. Hey, there we go. Um, but also, if you can see um, the 2A and the 2B, once the first blob, this resource, has run, these two resources here can run at the same time. So should I show you a live demo of this? Yes. All right, let's do this. We'll actually do one that looks, let's do this one. So this blob here will take 15 seconds to run. This one should take 10, 10, and 10. So the whole thing should take how long? Math is not with us this morning. So uh, 10 seconds, then then, and then another 10. And this one will take 15. So the whole thing together should take about 30 seconds. That's right. And we're going to ask the system that when you're converged, um, please, please converge. And once you're converged for five seconds, quit. So the whole thing together after that should take, ooh, that's loud. I hear some. OK, so this is the little, this is actually running the tool. And so the whole thing in general will time it, will run this. So it starts up. If you look here, you can see the 15 second install and this 10 second thing are both running at the same time. Time goes by, 10, 20, or 10 seconds go by. And then right away, this first one finishes 10 seconds later. And the second one starts up. Five seconds after that, you can see that in parallel, this other one finished running. Five more seconds after that, that third blob finished, and that third blob at the bottom started. So these blobs are really resources. So this is something that's actually doing some work in a very specific way. Um, goes through. This uh, last one finishes. Five seconds go by, and boom, if you can see, it took about 36 seconds. So that 30 seconds waited for five. Very little overhead. Make sense? Whoever's on their email is like busy focusing on their email. Everyone else is awake. So that's basically the idea. You can run in parallel. Turned out to be quite efficient and useful. Uh, the second aspect is the event-driven aspect. So you think of like Puppet or existing tools that run. They go through the whole res resource graph, and then 30 minutes later, they start up and run again. Right? Go through whole, the whole thing, checking, applying, and everything. But in fact, if you, haven't, um, if you want to make a change outside of that 30-minute window, um, or if after your tool is run, something changes, you won't actually notice until the tool runs again. Right? So in fact, what we actually do is we start up, we watch for um, events on every single resource, and we also check and apply. And then if something changes, we can instantly fix it right away. So demo, demo, yeah. live demo, all right. So we'll just do a very simple graph. Okay. 
just sit here. Much more comfortable. So this graph just has three resources. So there's a F1 file, an F2, and an F3 file. And they each have contents IMF2, IMF1, IMF3, and so on. And this fourth file here basically says I shouldn't exist. So we're actually just going to run this over here. And on the right-hand side, we'll just make a directory so you can see these files. There's nothing here. Um, ooh, a little squealing there. So we're going to run this thing, and very quickly, we go here you can see that it's made the three files. And you can, can you see that OK in the back on the terminals? Yes? Can you hear me in the back? That's a good start. All right, good. So you can see that the three files have those contents. We can actually just remove F2 and cat F2, and it comes back, right? So remove F2, it's right there. But it works so quickly, you can actually remove F2 and cat F2 in the same line. And as quickly as you do this, the file just sort of comes back. Um, and of course, you can do things like echo, hey, Debian, um, and put it into F2 and cat F2, and still, still sort of same thing. Um, and if you do this, um, cat f2, you can actually even watch, which runs this thing over and over so quickly that as fast as you're running it, the engine on the other side is actually noticing these things and fixing it as soon as possible. Now, this is maybe not um, very exciting just for files, but think about all the different resource types that we can actually apply instantly when you want to make a change. And when we look at higher level resources, like, say, virtual machine resources, or container resources, or even some sort of database resource, all of this stuff will happen live very quickly in a real management engine. Um, any questions quickly? Questions? No. All right. Shall we continue? How much time? Uh, six and a half minutes. Six and a half minutes. So this is so just some examples. So for systemd, for services, we use systemd events to get this information. For packages, um, this isn't possible be without the excellent package team, part of which uh, Zimian is in the back um, and helped make this possible and answered my stupid questions on IRC. So thanks, thanks to him. Um, and what does this really feel like? I've said this is config management. What does it really feel like to you or feel like to me? I think this is actually sort of a vague sort of kind of monitoring. Because you think about actually putting together a system that has config management, but also monitoring the state live so you can fix things or notify someone if something changes. So it's all trying to wrapping things up. Um, really quickly, the last quick demo I'll do. So this is a, just a quick topology that you might be familiar with. You have a client ser uh, clients and servers. Um, what's the problem with this kind of topology? Single point of failure. Single point of failure. What's another problem? Scalability. Scalability, right? Here's a different topology. The arrows are actually pointing down or downwards. This is a central orchestrator. Um, and what's the problem with this sort of topology? Single point of failure, that's right. Same thing. And what else? Scalability. scalability again, right? So you have the answers. Um, so in fact, um, just skipping forward, we actually build a kind of a, a network like this where everyone any is a peer, and every peer can talk to any other peer in theory. But we actually do is elect temporary primary machines, uh, which become the, the etcd masters, because we build an etcd and the raft algorithm to do this. And that's how we communicate. And what I'm actually going to show you is how these machines actually talk together. So what we want to do is we want to have a machine be able to put information up somewhere, in this case into a distributed key value store that's managed by the cluster, and have other machines be able to pull that information down. So each machine which I'm going to show you is going to have one file which it creates on itself, and one file that it pushes up. So on that first machine, puts one file on itself, puts one file up, how many files is it going to get on itself? One plus one, two, exactly. Very good. Um, let me just show you this, see it working. So, so I'm just going to run this. And actually, we need to make a directory for each of these machines. And I'll do that right here. And we can just tree that. OK, so you could see there's, in this case, four directories, one to represent each machine, just because I don't have a lot of machines with me right now. So we'll run this first. We'll just run each thing at a time. So we run this, starts up, and boom, you have two files. So it puts one of those files on itself. The second one, it puts a virtual sort of representation in this 
in this database, and then it sees what's in this database, and it pulls it back down, so you've got two. Should we start up the second one? Start up the second one. Um, so we'll actually do the same sort of thing. Now we point it at anyone in the cluster so that they can cluster together. We start up the second one. Same thing. How many files are we going to have on, the, on this new machine? I see a three. That's correct. So you have one on itself, pushes one up, and then pulls everything down, which is now two. And that first machine, how many is it going to have? It's going to have three. So let's run this. See how fast? Boom. They now have three on each of themselves. Should we add a fourth one? A third one, I mean? OK. So let's continue this game. Um, how many files now on, on when we run this? That's right, four. You guys are getting it. We're counting. Counting as a team. It's great to work together. So we run this. Very quickly, you get four files. And the other two notice instantly that something has happened, and they add those additional files. So this kind of pattern would be used for something like one machine might be a web server, which wants to have traffic routed to it. So it would say, hi, I've turned on my web server. I'm available at this port. Please route traffic to me. And a router might be looking for these sort of patterns and saying, ah, I'm looking for web servers that match a certain pattern. I will now open a route to you um, on the fly when you ask for it. Um, and similarly, if the web server were to shut down, the router would see that rule disappear and shut down. Make sense? Um, very important for automation stuff. So we've actually now um, started three machines. Should we add one more just for fun? All right, I have one more here, and then I definitely run out of terminal windows. Um, so it doesn't show very. So I'm going to run this fourth one, and starts up, and then quickly you can see that they all have those those there. And if I actually just actually ask the cluster how many servers are actually running, so you'll see there's three servers that are participating in this cluster. Okay, everyone else becomes a client because we don't need an infinite amount of of primary servers. But what were to happen if we were to kill one of these machines? So let's just pick one here. I don't like this one. It's somehow it's, it's on fire. So I'm just going to kill it. And if we go back here and look, you can see now that it used to be H1, 2, and 3. But now H3 has died. So it has automatically said, I'm going to start up a new machine because we wanted, in this case, at least three servers. All right, so this sort of happens automatically. It's built into the code base. Um, there's some more demos, but we're almost out of time. So that is the um, same thing. We kill a demo. Uh, we, kill, we kill a server, and a new one comes back up uh, right away. Um, there are more demos. Uh, again, I'm not going to show you them. This is sort of some slides on all of the magic that happens, which you can watch in the video. It's super fast. Um, and uh, you can actually even run existing Puppet code on this engine. That's a, a little side project that a colleague or a friend of mine is working on. Uh, future work, lots of stuff to still do. Um, this is really about a community project. It's not a product. So if you want to be involved, please send me some patches. You can use Twitter or um, blog about this or something like that. Um, hack on it. Hack on it, right? Listen to the slides. Um, this is a marketing slide. Again, told you it's a project. We can recap. My now let me recap. This is Arthur Benjamin as he recaps his pen to sort of finalize. Here's some links. Um, I've actually written four blog posts about this right now. So if you want to have a look online, here are some links. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, I'm here for today and the morning tomorrow. So please join us. We also have an IRC channel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next up is Neelam Murray talking about the Meerkat radio telescope. Testing, testing. Yep. Great. Okay, so it's actually not just me, I'm Elin Murray, but this is my colleague Martin Trubber, and I will, I will be talking and he'll be driving. Um, but he's, okay, so we're doing it on his laptop because he's on our VPN. So this is not just talking, us talking about the radio telescope, it's us showing you the radio telescope live. So you're gonna, we're going to move stuff that's hundreds of kilometers away from here live on the screen. Um, uh, we've disabled the no, 
machine for tonight, <laughs> just for safety. Um, could I see my stuff? Yeah, if I can. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not that kind of no, telescope, um, alas. Right, okay, so I'm um, okay. What do I push to get the next slide when I want to do that? You, 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 I don't where is me? Okay, I don't understand this Mac stuff. So, uh, <laughs> right, okay, so. So, Mirkat, so why, why with this, at, we're at this conference because we use Debian and derivatives, you can guess which one, quite a lot. Um, we are we, we're actually from what we call the control and monitoring group, so uh, as you might imagine, a telescope consists of a whole bunch of different things and we make them work together. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a, not what our telescopes look like, these are optical telescopes, this is kind of a very serious amateur model, this is more of a professional science telescope, but next um, so, radio telescopes look like this. Um, okay, I'm not, ours doesn't look like this, ours look more like this, but they basically look like big satellite dishes, but they're not listening at, to satellites, they pointed at stars or other interesting stellar objects. Okay, so ours look more like this. Oh, sorry. So, this is, oh, okay, this is the difference. Why radio telescope? So, this is an optical image, this is a radio telescope image of exactly the same piece of sky, and if you put them together, you can see that kind of tell you different things. So, um, I'll get into that why now, so next slide. So, this guy is Sir Herschel, someone or other, I forgot his name now, but um, <laughs> he's, uh, he does an interesting experiment. So, when he was alive, people already knew about the spectrum. You could take light, you could put it through a prism, and you get three colors. And then what this guy did was quite interesting. He decided to measure the temperature of colors. So, that's different from the temp color temperature you might be familiar with from your monitor, but anyway. So, he had thermometers and he put a thermometer on each color and then he saw, my goodness, the hottest color is invisible. Here beyond red there's some other light which is even hotter than the red light. And that's when infrared was discovered. Okay. And then there's this guy, uh, James Clark Maxwell. Ma 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 Maxwell. He's a personal hero of mine. In my other life I'm an electromagneticist. Um, so he made the equation of electromagnetics but mainly he realized that light and radio waves and all that stuff is all part of the same same thing. So we have a spectrum, right? Here we have uh, visible light. And, yeah, anyway, yeah. Visible light, right? So, as the frequency goes higher, your wavelength gets shorter, so light has very high frequency and very short wavelengths, which is why you can see fine details of it easily. And at the lower end you have radio waves, which have low frequencies and very big wavelengths. But it's all part of electromagnetics. Next. So, this is uh, the Sun. The Sun is also a star. And the Sun is essentially a very hot ball of gas, uh, hydrogen <coughs> fusion powered. And when you make a ball of gas very hot, it acts as a black body radiator. Next slide. Okay, so it radiates depending on its temperature. So, that's Kelvin. That's 5,800 Kelvin is about the Sun's temperature, I think. Um, it radiates the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Most of the energy is concentrated around the visible and infrared uh, range, but it's also got some radio energy. So that's what you look at with a radio telescope. Okay, so you can't see the whole spectrum because we have this wonderful thing called the atmosphere, we should be very thankful. Now the atmosphere blocks most radio, uh, most x-rays and gamma rays and stuff like that. That's very good. If it didn't, we'd all be dead. Um, but then, visible light, somewhat surprisingly, does manage to come through the atmosphere, and that's why we evolved to see it, because it, it comes through the atmosphere. But there's also what we call the radio window, and you can see it's quite wide. The radio waves um, for a fairly ra high frequency range, fairly big frequency range, can reach our beautiful telescopes. Okay, so here's another example of the difference. So this is an optical image, same thing in radio. And what you can see with radio is the hydrogen gas, and our telescope can do these kind of observations. It's 21 centimeters, that's about 1.4 something gigahertz. So, between the stars there's always going to be hydrogen gas, right? You might know that all stars are made out of hydrogen, it's, a, it's the original thingy, and it gets fused together, right? And, you know, you can tell cool things from, a, from the radio gas. Oh, go on, go on, go on, we've got to speed up. Okay, so this is the first radio telescope, circa 1930, that's the Ford Model T wheel. Next uh, slide, this is the second radio telescope called Rebus Radio Telescope, and most um, radio telescopes still look like this, so next slide. Um, but 
as a reminder, the energy in the radio spectrum is very small, so you want to make your telescopes rather big. Loss of mass, basically, it says the bigger you make a telescope, the more sensitive it is. In other words, it can pick up weaker signals, and the higher your resolution of your image that you can form. Um, so people went bigger and bigger, and oh, this one crashed. See, that's a, what a telescope crash looks like. So that's not a good idea. So, right. Oh, here we go. That's the James Bond telescope. There was a fight scene in the Arecibo telescope. It's pretty freaking huge. And then this is a current Chinese telescope being built, which is astoundingly huge. But you can't really move them, so that's not very convenient. They're very, very useful instruments, but you can't move them. So there's this other approach called interferometry, where you have a whole bunch of dishes working together, and your resolution is determined by the space between your dishes. That was in the movie Contact. That's a big radar telescope in America, EDLA. Next. And um, just an example, if your telescope is one kilometer apart, your dishes, that's what the images look like. If your telescope has dishes that are 36 kilometers apart, much higher resolution. So there's another little thing, it's Moore's law. As you build a dish bigger, it gets bigger per it gets more expensive per surface area. As you use more dishes, your computation goes up by n squared. So as computing gets cheaper, we're using more and more dishes, so we're building our telescopes. Um, right. So in around 2000, there was this international project called the SKA project, known to build a really big telescope. Um, right. And this is where our telescope is. It's kind of in the middle of a country. There's nothing going on there. Uh, this is a map of the population density of South Africa. We're right here. See, it's red. Here, there's no people. Why? Because people make radio interference. We don't want that. Next. Okay, so this is CAT7. So we finished this one in about, well, about 2012. It was feature complete. But it's really almost, it's not quite a, it's, it's a big telescope. It's 7, 12 meter dishes, but it's almost a toy. Um, but we did learn a lot. And we didn't invent some new techniques, some of them which we're going to use going forward. Next one. And this is Meerkat. So Meerkat is going to be 64 dishes. At the moment, we have 16. Um, it's, yes, Meerkat. It's actually a joke. Meer means more, as in bigger. And we have got more money to build a bigger cat, Guru Array Telescope. Right, there we go. And um, it's, it's, it's awesome. A lot of the technologies for the SKA redeveloping in Meerkat. Next slide. OK, so there's going to be 64. This is kind of an aerial photo of where they'll be. Next one. Uh, it's got a lot of cool stuff. It's got digitizer right at the dish. Okay, it's go, 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 go. Okay, we should switch straight to the demo. Okay. So, now. Um, I need my screen to... I need to find my cursor. Ah. Ah, ah, I see it. Okay, so we, uh, we have this nice GUI. So, this is telling us all the resources which are in our subarray. You can split the telescope up into different subsets of antennas. And as you show us the webcam, you can actually see them right. These are the live, this is a live web feed from our site, which is about 500 kilometers away. And what we will do now for you, ladies I'm and gentlemen, is, oh, you're running it. Yeah. Okay, so we have a scheduling system. And he's going to start a schedule block, yeah, which will, block running. is it going to move them for us? I hope so. We haven't tried it. Oh. Well, what should happen is that you should actually be able to see the antennas move on the screen because it's running the telescope. A minute ago. Oh, it moved a minute ago. No, no. Oh, no, sorry. Okay. Is it signal display? Anyway, and these are the live signal display. So this is so you don't actually get the images live. You have to do lots of image processing to get that. But this is a, just kind of a, in the operator room. These displays are up, and they tell us how much energy, or how much radio energy is being received. And this is, a, this is a pointing display. It's showing us what's the angle, the azimuth, and the elevation of each, each uh, telescope. And as you can see, they are moving, right? So currently, they are moving. And if you go to the webcam, hopefully, you should see the notice them moving. It doesn't update fast enough. Can you make it bigger? If I can capture the corner here, which is, I can't see. Ah, here we go. <laughs> yeah. It's not doing... Is that our end? That's our end. Great, thank you. That is basically it, actually. Oh, so it didn't really move. That's, that's too bad. Oh, well. In any case, this really was live, and it could, you could have seen it move, but you didn't. But 
It's all Bolton Deviant, so we thank you, and we're doing real sign service, and it's going to be awesome. Thank you. Um, no, no, we scheduled it out. Yes. Well, what we did, we started an hour of, of a real um, observation, and I was actually a little bit upset because I didn't read our email, but that's where it from. You may have met this man before. Doing a thing. The joke is that I only know two words of Arabic, which were taught to me by two very nice Lebanese. Which were taught to me by two very nice Lebanese girls, and it's nothing like you're thinking at all, unfortunately. Um, and also, I haven't plugged in the video, so I was going to do mine this time, but I can see from the looks I'm getting that that's a bad idea. So nobody likes mine, apparently. Hands up, who likes mine? Natty likes mine. Not the male thing, the... Oh, look. Wow. Okay. Okay, uh, Sean says he likes mine, so he's probably going to make me do mine now, which kind of sucks for me. Oh. Wait, do we actually hear you? I don't know. Can you hear me? I'm going to put up pictures of penguins while we sort that out. Okay, can you hear me now? All right, let's do that, uh, where is it, Verizon commercial? Okay, so, um, right, so what's the point of this? Um, there is a big collection of extensions to Emacs. For those of you who don't know, Emacs is a Lisp virtual machine, which some people use to edit text, but also does a whole bunch of other things. Um, and there are available uh, one more package since the last time I gave this demo, so it's growing quickly. Um, 3,193 packages. Um, the, it's, it's a project driven more by enthusiasm than by quality assurance, so a few of these packages are still maintained on a wiki somewhere, and it's automatically packaging the wiki. So if you're not scared yet, you should be. Um, so Sean and I have been working on some tools to help bring some of these packages into Debian, not the ones that are maintained on the wiki, um, and sort of insert a little quality control into this cycle. So let's see if Sean has any, uh, if my controller has any instructions for me. Um, okay, no instructions yet. So um, let me just... So here's a package which, for some reason, Sean wants to package for uh, Debian. And, and I read the README, and you probably can't read the README because it's kind of small, so let me make it bigger. And I still have no idea how I'm going to demo this. A generic completion method based on balance. OK, so it's a thing, right? And um, it does something about completion in Emacs, and we're going to package it for, for Debian. All right, so um, mildly confused. Oh, click on the click on the link. Click on the link to GitHub. All right, going back. Um, okay, here's a, so here's someone uh, using this thing and they're typing K and it's showing some completions. If you hit S, you'll get, you'll start completing those things. So it's sort of giving you this global completion view. Um, I, I'm totally making this up. I've never seen this screenshot before, but okay, so something like that. All right, so it lets you jump around. Well, you can read the IRC thing. So it lets you jump around using the first letter of words. Accessibility. Hmm? Accessibility. Right, right. F and T commands in Vim, but on other lines. So those of you who know what Vim is might know what he's talking about. OK, so, um, so uh, 
shall we start? Uh, Lainey, are you asserting you know what Vim is? Is that what you're... Good, good. I'm not following your instructions, Lainey. I'm not falling for that again. No, you. You dance. Um, okay. Oops, he left. Yeah, but GitHub is a big place. I, I need um, more uh, specific instructions here. For crying out loud. Well, you know, this is part of the charm of ahem, this. Wow. Oh, right. Abo, abo, slash avi. Very good. Yeah, hurry up, Sean. It's the deadline. So we decided to spend more time in the beginning talking about general things, and now we regret it. OK, so the last uh, stable release actually has a tag, yay, um, which is not guaranteed with this bunch. Uh, oops. What? 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 Uh, OK, there we go. Yay. OK, so now. All right, so I think we're going to fix. So um, we may run out of time this time, but actually sort of the interesting point about this is that Sean and I have written tools that take upstream metadata and use it for Debian packaging. So upstream is maintaining some metadata here in the file. Of course, in the charming way of upstreams everywhere, they're maintaining the wrong metadata, but nonetheless, that's OK, because that's fixed. Uh, so let's go back to our shell. Now I think we're ready. So the minus package emaxon says use the team defaults. The team is more or less Sean and I at the moment, but we wish it was more people. Um, that's not quite true, but OK. So it says, you know what? You shouldn't really just upload this thing um, that you generated with our experimental script, but we don't care. We're going to do it anyway. OK, so um, some things scrolled by fast there. I don't know how we're doing for time. Probably have two minutes left or so. Yeah, two and a half. Two, well, OK. So one thing that is good that is that we ran the test suite. Um, now to try it out, I need another Emacs instance. More Emacs is better. Um, let's see, you can't see that really well, can you? Um, yes, he's telling me I need a new Emacs instance. Lag is awesome. OK, so, um, so I'm so No, it's installed. So that's, uh, oh, I cheated. It's installed from the last demo. Sorry. Let's cheat. Um, we're short for time. So, OK, so I could have installed this deb, and in fact, I did on Tuesday. So this is the, the actually, but I'm sure it's all totally reproducible and exactly the same, right? Because how could it not be? So um, let's see. Let's just spend another second here. I type E. And then it's telling me to type L. And now if I type, oh, it's just like a little menu thing, right? If I go A, it'll go to that line. And if I go J, oh, I get it. I finally understand how to use this thing. OK, cool. So sorry if you didn't, but at least I figured it out now. And it, it actually seems like it could be useful. Now we have one minute. And uh, Habibi is telling me to speed up. Um, so, 
One thing that is cool is that um, we have an actually correct-ish uh, depth five copyright file generated. Um, so it's got the upstream source. And um, also, well, Debian slash rules is pretty boring, but that's actually kind of the point. So the minus with Alpa just says use our helper tool and uh, packaging max is totally trivial and you should all do it. Thanks. And uh, I have 10 seconds or something? Yeah. Uh, okay, let's go back to the penguins then. One, two, one. Penguins! All right. Up next is Mr. Phi doing some Phi. At this point, I'd like to say hello, Louisa. <laughs> she's not here. She's she's been to DevConf before, so hello. On? Yeah, it seems to be on. So I will show you the Phi CD. There are several flavors of the CD. Um, Phi is a fully automatic installation. You can install virtual machine, bare, mich uh, bare metal, uh, change root environments. So if you're on the website, just download the ISO or get one of the other ISOs. Um, the differences are which packages are already included on the CD. And I now just uh, start a virtual machine with the CD. And then there's a short uh, grub menu. We select the client installation. This is a little bit secured. You have to answer fire and install, so because the whole disk will be wiped. So, and then we get a little menu where we can select which type of installation we want to do a simple installation without any uh, graphical desktop and XFCE or GNOME desktop. We can all ins also install CentOS or Ubuntu. Those uh, with those installations, the packages would be downloaded uh, from the network. I just start the XFCE installation. And while the installation is running, we have some more information and uh, Maybe you can just distribute it. And yeah, I'm here for questions. Any questions? Wait for the mic. Repeat the question. Uh, the question was how do I generate or create the CD? Once I set up the Phi server, I have two commands. One for creating the partial package mirror, and then the other command just takes the, 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 the ins install environment, the partition mirror, and my configuration, and creates a bootable CD. So two commands, that's it. Uh, which architecture do you support? Uh, we support the E3, uh, the 32-bit and 64-bit Intel architectures currently. In the, in the past, we had also users that installed the IBM mainframes, um, Itanium, Spark architectures, Solaris. Yeah, so this, this is also possible. Alpha. Alpha, yeah, we also had an alpha user, yeah. Ah, that was you. <laughs> oh, hello, hello alpha user. So now you can see the packages are already installed. At the end, the customization scripts were executed, and they were also fine. And the installation took 115 seconds. I now reboot again. Uh, and the grub menu now defaults to boot from the first disk partition. This is a normal grub environment. And 
now it starts the desktop. I, in, in the configuration, I said, please create a demo user with the secret password FAI. And then you have your brand new machine. And what I did, I said, oh, I want to have the GIMP tool also installed during this installation. And it's here. That's it. More questions? Uh, soft update. Yeah, normally this was an initial installation, but FI can also do a soft update. So if you have installed your desktop or server once with FI and you change some things in the configuration, we call this soft update. So we do not do a complete new installation, but we do an update of the package list and the customization script may change things in ETC or in other things. So it's also possible this is a configuration management part. Uh, we use mostly shell scripts for our things, but if you have a CF engine or puppet environment, you can also use this with FAI. Or MGMT. Oh, or, or yeah, in the future also MGMT, sure. Five minutes. Five minutes, questions, come on. Oh, no. <laughs> um, uh, how would you customize things? What I can show you is, uh, for example, the disk configuration. Um, and and there's, there's a class feature. Um, these are files that describe how the disk will be partitioned. It, they, they just look like FS tab files. So it's very easy to write a file for, for a different partition type. And for the software package selection, we have a directory. And in this directory, we have several files. And every file will be selected if it matches a file class name. And they look just like this. In the first line, we say which package tool we want to use. We also support the RPM packages. And, ju and then just give the list of the package names. You can also add the slash testing or use apt pinning. Yeah, so it's just write down the name of the packages that will be installed if the machine belongs to the class Debian in this, in this case. Uh, what else can I show you? We have also a monitor tool. So if you install a lot of machines, it will look like this. And there's also an animation if I have my network running. Not yet. So every machine uh, connects the server and says, hello, I'm booting up. I'm doing the partitioning part. I'm doing the package installation. I'm doing the customization part. And then you have a nice tool just to see, uh, yeah, ah, there it is. It would run like this, maybe not that fast. Uh, and so you could monitor the machines during uh, their installation. And the color says, oh, everything is fine, or we have minor or major problems with it. And then you have to look at the log files. And the log files will all be copied onto the server. So even the, the machine will not manage to reboot. You have the log files on the server. and can see which things went wrong. OK, more questions. OK, then, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for coming. The next lightning talks will be next year in Montreal. See you then. Bye.